southwest. Thanks, Julie. So there's a, a lot I'd like to uh, cover today. We have limited time, so some things are going to get short shrift. But um, first, I just want to acknowledge there are a lot of co-ops on this. We're working with a lot of collaborators. And you can see that the main collaborators here drawing a lot of Yale Bruce's dissertation work. And we've been working with all these other partners on the, some of the case studies I'll be talking about. Just to give you an overview of the presentation, I want to briefly talk about the value of fraternity ecosystems in the Southwest and Western United States, uh, the alterations they've been subject to, and then uh, move into uh, the Bill and Tamaris and the Tamaris Beetle. Since we're all here at the Tamaris Coalition Conference, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. There'll be a lot of other talks coming up. And then move on to sort of some key things about what are the vegetation trajectories of these systems with and without the Tamaris Beetle and with and without active management. And then what does that mean for uh, adjusting our sort of classic restoration strategies to adapt to this changing environment, climate change, as well as the beetle moving through the various systems and other you know, changes that we're seeing from human uses. So desert library ecosystems are very valuable. I think you know, if you're in this audience here, you probably understand all that. They support a high diversity and productivity of uh, native species when they're not altered. Provide wildlife habitat, water resources for uh, ecosystems and humans, recreational use, and a variety of other ecosystem functions and services. The native cottonwood and willow gallery forests in the southwest are adapted to cyclical flooding. So rivers and riparian ecosystems they support are naturally dynamic systems. So that's the most important thing to keep in mind when you're planning restoration at a site scale as well as a reach or watershed scale. You need to, if you're looking at the site, look upstream. <laughs> Things that are happening upslope and upstream are affecting your water, your site. So under natural con conditions, we'll be focusing on three species here: Stoneton Sugiwa, uh, Gooding's Willow, and, and Populus Fremontia. The prior talk set that up nicely. Um, under natural conditions, these were subject to sort of periodic uh, flood pulses, uh, often a mild or moderate one on an annual basis, and then once or twice a decade, a much larger flood that tended to reset these systems and scour, scour out a lot of the mature vegetation. And so we see you know, under natural conditions, you sort of got this up and down uh, cycle going you know, a couple times a decade with these bigger floods. And these supported a, a nice, diverse natural community. But then over time, with the development of the American West, we started to uh, needing water for human uses. A lot of the, the major infrastructure, uh, larger dams started coming into affecting a lot of our river systems. And with that, we started interfering with this natural flood pulse. We created hydrologic changes that decreased, in many cases, the, the frequency, duration, and magnitude of these larger flood events. And with that, we started to see, in many cases, a decline in cottonwood, especially, getting getting swell in some cases, and maybe to a lesser degree, the signal of the cottonwood willow. But we also saw during the same sort of time period a coincident introduction and naturalization and expansion of tamaris. Tamaris, as I think most of you know, was a native state of Eurasia introduced to the U.S. in the 1800s, and that generally became invasive in the 1920s on, coinciding with this period of, of dam development and, and river regulation in the, the western U.S. So with that, we see from the natural flood pulse to this period of hydrologic change with the dams, and that hydrologic change tended to promote the introduction and expansion of tamaris. So in many of our sits, river systems now, we see tamaris swamming and much greatly reduced abundance and distribution of the native cottonwood willows. As the speaker this morning mentioned, over a million and a half acres in the western U.S. are now affected by tamaris, a big problem. The uh, impacts of tamaris invasion on the ecosystem uh, functions are well documented. There's just some amount, so we're displacing native primary plant species, altering habitat structure, uh, in some cases, deteriorating soil through increased salinity, uh, depleting groundwater supplies, uh, also affecting the, the local mycorrhizal communities that we heard about in the prior talk, and a variety of other factors. And one of the things I'll be talking about today is the tamaris wild fire cycle and how. The introduction and spread of tamaris has introduced the fire as a major disturbance to our systems. And here we go. 
So in the natural situation, native cottonwood and willow, riparian forests are fairly resilient and resistant to uh, fire. Often they, they tend as a, to serve as a, a fire break when the fire is spreading from adjacent to communities, it tends to stop at the edge of the riparian boundary. Now with the introduction of invasive species such as tamarisk, we get a buildup of a lot of uh, fuel. Tamarisk is highly flammable. It can create this high fuel level, both the, uh, the woody structure on the tree plus the leaf litter, which as you can see in situations like this, uh, sites like I've seen on the, uh, the Gila River, like I call old growth tamarisk, you get very dense uh, development of uh, fuel load, it creates a ladder fuel structure that can uh, really spread the fire to that canopy. We get extreme fire behavior, very large uh, flame lanes uh, created by these tamarisk fires. And often we get very large and intense fires. That's another, another factor. The uh, native riparian systems, prior to the introduction of tamarisk, if they have fire, it's generally a lower intensity. One of the key points I'd like you to go home with today is that the tamarisk numbers increase the fire risk, not just to the, the general riparian ecosystem, but in particular to the native uh, species we're concerned with, the Fremont cottonwood, which serves as a foundational species, as well as the native uh, willows and other plants. And Gail Drew's uh, dissertation work showed that there's sort of a threshold effect. Um, so here in this graph, you can see uh, mortality of cottonwoods and willows, populous and salix on the y axis, the percent tamarisk cover on the x axis going from zero to uh, a proportion of one or 100%. And right about the midpoint, especially for the cottonwood, the populous, you get close to 100% mortality of cottonwoods if a fire starts and tamarisk is a relative cover of tamarisk is 50% or greater. So there's a threshold effect that's very important. And with this, we get the creation of a, what we're calling the tamarisk fire cycle, which can alter by very community composition. As I mentioned, uh, in the early stages of tamarisk introduction, it may increase the frequency of lower intensity fires. But as the tamarisk dominance increases and the fuel loads increase, we shift into this other regime of uh, more frequent, higher intensity fires. That tends to create a positive feedback loop, promoting uh, increased uh, dominance by tamarisk and reduction in the native species. So, what can we do with, about this? Um, then we want to be down at this end, end of the spectrum here. The natives are at least native dominant, or maybe a mix of natives and tamarisk that we can, we can handle this to promote some native that want to diversity, want to have there. We want to get away from these tamarisk dominated communities. What can we do to change that trajectory? Well, one thing that's definitely affecting these systems has been the introduction of the tamarisk beetle for biological control. Uh, there are various other talks at the conference on this, so I'm not going to go into detail. Um, the program has been a biological success in the, the initial areas. The beetle is now spreading. Um, we see a lot of uh, intensive and very obvious defoliation as the beetle first spreads through the system. You can see with this span of weeks, you can go from a very green tamarisk to a, a brown down one. And generally, over a period of years, we start seeing mortality in tamarisk after successive uh, repeat defoliation events. This uh, incremental dieback alone may start opening up ecological space and allow the natives to recover, but it may also provide uh, opportunity for secondary invasive weeds to come in. So, when you're looking at a system, you have to understand is the system operating fairly naturally? Are, are you likely to get natives coming back in if the beetle spreads, or are you going to get uh, undesirable secondary weeds? And what does this all mean for species such as the native South and Willow Uh Beetles now widespread. Then, when we're stocked tomorrow, we'll give an update on the beetle distribution. Just to uh, point out for the case studies, we'll be talking about the Virgin River, which is an area in southern Nevada that has been uh, invaded by the tamarisk beetle. Also, be talking about the Upper Gila River in Arizona, which has not yet experienced the, the beetle, but is expected to arrive soon. So, how does the uh, recovery by the tamarisk? Uh, control agent affect the fire system. Can we, is that enough to set the system back to this point where we have uh, lower intensity fires that may promote sort of a mixed uh, vegetation community of native cottonwoods and willows with uh, tamarisk say, at levels below 50%? And 
get along with the penal, what if we're doing certain types of active respiration active management? I'm going to be a little short on time, but my key hypothesis. Okay, great, thanks. Um, my, my key hypothesis is that this gradual decline in terrorists, as the beetle spreads, it does this thing, it starts inducing at least partial mortality, opening up small gaps in the terrorist dominated systems, is that we'll start seeing a recovery of native plants and wildlife. And ideally, if, we just, if the system operates alone, we're still getting some structure there that has. Uh, affects microclimate, may provide still value for certain wildlife for stuff like fly catcher, as well as uh, sort of nurse plant conditions for the natives to recover. Uh, so in some cases, we may be able to just let the system recover on its own, but in many cases, active, active, active restoration will be needed. So now, I think we're going to go into two case studies. Uh, I and my collaborators have talked about this several times in the past four or five years at the San Francisco Coalition Conference. So I won't go into great detail here, but we're working on the uh, Lower Virgin River in Nevada for the Clark uh, County Nevada Multi-Species ACP Conservation Program, and with the Human Watershed Partnership here in Stafford, Arizona, and the Upper Human mm -hmm. River. In both cases, uh, the systems are dominated by cameras. There are relatively few and small patches of native, native species of cottonwood voles left in the system. Uh, they support important habitats for endangered southwest and rural flight catcher. In the Virgin River system, as I mentioned, the, the beetle is already present. In the uh, upper Gila system, we're estimating, <laughs> we've been saying this for a couple of years now, but in the next two to five years, we'll probably get one or more of the, uh, the cameras beetles moving into the system. And uh, we're trying to you know, do some restoration in advance of that on the Gila River system. So, in both cases, there's potential short term impacts to the Southwest Gila Fine Catch and other wildlife as that. Tamarisk have that structure gets defoliated and before the they recover. But we want to figure out what can we do to promote more rapid recovery of the native species. Uh, just to describe this, we use what we call an eco-hydrological approach to restoration planning for river corridors. We we're able to use a variety of GIS and uh, remote sensing tools along with focused field efforts to rapidly survey river corridors of you know, 50 to 120 miles. And what we're trying to do is figure out what are the, the conditions that really affect that, that biophysical template that's the foundation upon which uh, our restoration efforts can occur. And what are the various factors involved? Well, we talked about the logic regime talks earlier this morning, so we're looking at the hydrology. Is the system still operating under a fairly natural hydrologic regime? Are the dams on the system? Are there uh, Summer irrigation diversions or groundwater pumping that might affect uh, summer conditions and that can uh, affect the establishment of cottonwood and moss. And how, how frequently does the system get these big floods that will wipe out the system? And you want to use that understanding of the flood scour and flood risk when you decide where to do reactive management. You don't necessarily want to put all your eggs in one basket and have them wiped out the next year by a 10 year flood event. So you want a risk management decision. Uh, we're looking at the, the existing vegetation. You know, where are those, those patches of native plants? Uh, what can we do to expand those those nodes of, of natives that uh, provide both a seed source, a propagule source for uh, reestablishing natives, as well as habitat for a variety of species? What do we know about water availability, depth to groundwater? We often use a, using LIDAR to generate a relative elevation surface that can be a proxy for depth to groundwater. We look at soil salinity and soil texture. We also, uh, a lot of the work has been focused on you know, maintaining and, and increasing habitat for southwest little flight catcher as the beetle moves through the system. So, we're working with uh, folks like Jim Hatton and Matt Thompson to do uh, flight catcher modeling and uh, looking at a few other species in, in some other cases. I won't spend much time on this, but we, in the Virgin River system, we work with Utah State University, your remote sensing lab, actually on the Upper Gila as well. They collected high resolution uh, topography using LIDAR, uh, color, natural color, and multispectral ultra imagery, and they did some initial migratory vegetation classification and mapping. We looked at historical aerial imagery and data, and then we did some field based sampling to build on that. And as a result, we come up with examples like this. I don't have time to go into detail, but this is just a cross sectional profile across the uh, Upper Gila. Showing areas uh, dominated by uh, mesquite bosque, 
cameras that had burned recently. Other areas of dense cameras, and a few native cottonwoods and willows, especially near the Buffalo River Channel. And uh, I think with that, I'll just be happy to talk to you individually about this, and I covered this in, in talks in prior years. One of the things we're trying to do now with uh, availability is higher resolution, higher density LIDAR data is to uh, use it for mapping uh, vegetation and modeling habitat structure for a variety of species. Uh, I mentioned southwestern Gulf Lycan before, we're also looking at western Gulf and Cuckoo, and then in various areas starting to look at Bell's Burrio, especially in Southern California, we're using it for these Bell's Burrio habitat uh, modeling. And with the higher density LIDAR, you can start getting very accurate remote picture of uh, here's here's an emergent Fremont cottonwood tree, understory of uh, shorter stature willows. And up here, this, this is from the Santa Clara River in Southern California. You can actually see a run of Jonax stocks and cones coming up there. A very valuable uh, tool for hoping to take more advantage of. Using uh, the Southern Willow Flycatcher Landsat based screening habitat suitability model on the upper Hilo. We were able to develop um, to overlay the model predictions of areas that were currently suitable, providing high suitability habitat for southwest low flight capture, with areas that we had predicted would be good habitat based on the other components of ecological analysis. We use that to then identify sort of general restoration areas, and then start zeroing in on uh, medium shown in blue and, and high priority restoration areas showing in purple and magenta here, and. Uh, John Stone from the Gila Watershed Partnership is here at the conference this week. If you want to know the details, I'd be happy to tell you what I know, but John can really tell you about the, the very details of uh, what methods were they've been applying and how, how they've been responding. But the general approach in this system, in both, both growth systems, we want to restore the native riparian vegetation and provide suitable habitat for some of those fly capture. Uh, to do this, we want to do some some limited strategic removal and treatment of cameras to uh, open up some space for natives. And we also want to figure out what else can we do to facilitate natural recruitment of the native cottonwoods and willows and other species. In some cases, do active planting. And we didn't want to do this in sort of a phased patchwork approach so that we can minimize short term impacts, especially on the upper helo where the southwestern of the fly capture is present and nesting in the dense camera stands. We don't want to be removing all the cameras at once because that's providing good habitat. We want to be creating patches around that good fly catcher habitat, planting cottonwoods and willows, and then in three to five years we'll have good suitable native habitat for the fly catcher. And trying to do that on not just in advance of the beetle arriving as much as we can. So aside from expanding the, the good habitat nodes for fly catcher and other species, as I mentioned earlier, we want to look at other opportunities, maybe in smaller patches what we're calling propagule islands. And these are plantings of native cottonwoods and willows that can serve as sources of seeds or vegetative propagules in, in some, some cases, especially for uh, kind of um, that can then take advantage of natural flood regimes and help promote the natural recruitment pro recovery process of the system. And also, if after a fire or a flood in this area, it's cleared out a lot of the biomass or cameras, what can we do to, to take advantage of that situation? Uh, that's a Opportunity for a relatively low cost uh, active restoration effort to go in and revegetate with natives while the tamarisk is knocked back. Uh, in some cases, if the tamarisk is actively re sprouting, you may want to use some limited uh, chemical control as well to keep it under control. Here's just a couple of quick shots of uh, restoration implementation by the Gila Watershed Partnership. You can see this is a, a, a stand where there's a native cottonwoods and willows present. A lot of tamarisk in the understory, so we've used a mechanical removal of mulching to get rid of the tamarisk, but try to leave as many of the natives as possible. So this you might think of this as uh, like selective logging or forestry, doing the thinning of the tamarisk. And very quickly, they got uh, within a year, they got a lot of natural recruitment with this modest flood event coming in, uh, like a surprising amount of natural. Here's a shot from the uh, Virgin River in Utah near St. George, an area where the uh, beetles moved in. There's dense cameras that's getting defoliated, and a lot of the restoration efforts in that part of the Virgin River are doing uh, 
them to fit in. So they're leaving stuff that the dead or uh, defoliated terrace provide structure, then opening up smaller gaps around that using that plant natives. On the lower virgin river system working with uh, Clark County, you know, that they decide to do instead of like an individual selection of thinning, they might think of as a, a group selection in forestry where you're clearing out small patches of uh, a quarter acre to an acre. Once again, leaving the natives, in this case, getting the willows and removing the tamarisk. Looking for sites, we, we did eco ecological assessment at both the river corridor and site specific scale to identify sites like this that would be good for flight capture habitat, as well as high success of uh, native green vegetation. And we, uh, when the conditions are right, we're seeing good survival and, and, and growth of the, the plantings as well as a lot of natural recruitment. And in summary, since I'm out of time, just so wanted to stress once again that riparian ecosystems are naturally made happen. Human operations, including the introduction of tamarisk, have created novel riparian ecosystems. These systems are further being altered by the introduction of the tamarisk beetle, and it's shifting the vegetation trajectory of these systems in the future. What we need to do as restoration uh, planners and practitioners is understand what's the range of trajectories our systems are likely on, with and without the effects of management. Where, where and when should we intervene to shift the system into a more uh, desirable trajectory? And with that, I think the, um, we want to be thinking about things like the genetic stock and climate adaptation, such as the, the prior talk that I discussed, and a lot of other factors that I'd be happy to talk about you during the break. Thank you. Yeah, the question was where do we get our LIDAR imagery and what is the cost? And it really depends on the project. So these two projects, it was uh, a little lower cost than commercial LIDAR. There are a lot of commercial LIDAR vendors now that are delivering very good products. In the early years, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when we first started working with it, you had to be very careful about your technical specifications and, and watching all of that. Um, and usually you're, you're collecting LIDAR along with uh, Either natural photography or multispectral imagery. So ideally, you want both uh, gathered at the same time. And the cost for you know, there's, there's a scale dependent factor. So you know, usually it costs at least five thousand dollars just to sort of mobilize the equipment to play. Um, I think in both these systems, we're talking uh, fifty to sixty thousand dollars to do both the uh, the lidar and the other imagery the, or the photos and. Uh, veg classification. That was by Utah State's group. Commercial vendors um, often will get a little bit more, but the, the cost is coming down. So depending, we're often working at you know, 50 to 100 mile river corridors. Yeah, and then, and then there are um, the new, new techniques coming out are drone mounted LIDAR. We haven't worked with that yet. That would be an opportunity and presumably more cost effective for a smaller scale project. Hi, Bruce. Um, I was wondering if you are collaborating at all with the MSCP on the lighter habitat modeling for southwestern willow flycatcher, because I, I think they're also working on that. And I was wondering if you just been for the lower Colorado River. Yeah. Unfortunately, no. Um, we're actually we're trying to get in touch with them and, and figure out ways to collaborate. Um, and Jim Hatton, who's our you know, the model from USG, has is. is been in touch with a, a lot of other folks beyond just our projects. So we're definitely trying to do that. Um, and we are, um, like, as I mentioned, using LIDAR for, we're trying to use it now in San Clair River system in, in Southern California for cuckoo and uh, these skills very as well as the fly capture. Okay. Um, another question was Do you, with, in Alcahila, where you're removing veg, the saltier with machinery, are you getting a lot of growback? Of tamarisk, and are you removing that, or are you know backers just coming in and filling them? Yeah, let's see. Uh, I don't know if Sean's here right now, but uh, I'll let Sean, Sean Stell, the Peter Washington partnership answer that. Yes, yeah, so you want to know whether or not we're having a lot of tamarisk regrowth and how we're retreating it. So, we actually have had some tamarisk regrowth when we've adapted our herbicide application methods, such that we are 
uh, using a little bit greater herbicide. Um, but our success rate is actually really high. And if we're able to uh, replant as we are, are currently doing, um, we hope that we'll be able to suppress a lot of regrowth that will be happening. Um, so we are doing a lot of secondary weed treatment and retreat on our sites. Thanks, Sean. That is. All right, thank you.